Welcome to Detangle, where we untangle the complexities of life one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Kinjal Goel, a psychologist and a writer. A name that is synonymous with luxury, well, literally, as his branch reflects his name with his wife, Eva, Sonu Shivdasani is the man behind the chain of resorts called Soneva in the Maldives and Thailand. Sonu is not just your quintessential businessman, but a person who has built a business based on passion, love and inspiration. My introduction to Sonu happened at a beautiful time when I was at Soneva Jani, his newest resort in the Maldives, and I was stunned by how the remote yet accessible resort touched us in simple and unexpected ways. Simply put, it changed us as travellers forever by showing us that sustainability is not just a vague and abstract concept that belongs in an environment summit, but attainable by all of us with just a little mindfulness and intent. Welcome, Sonu, and thank you so much for joining me on Detangle today. Thank you, Kinjal. It's a real honour. I really appreciate it. Well, Sonu, there's so much that I want to talk to you about, so many questions that I have in mind. Let's get started with the questions and let's just see where they lead us. Wonderful. Perfect. So to begin with, Sonu, tell me, how did this all begin for you? I mean, how did a postgraduate in literature from Oxford decide to build luxury resorts in the Maldives and Thailand? Um, I was very young and I'm, I'm not sure I'd do it again. So um, I met my wife, Ava, um, wh- whilst I was studying at Oxford. Um, sh- she was living in Milan and um, she'd been on a modeling shoot here uh, in the Maldives back in 1981. Hmm. At that time, there were about four resorts. Um, there was one small airport. It took her literally um, an hour and a half to get to a resort that today, with all the modern infrastructure, would take you like 20 minutes or so. And um, all, the, all, they, all they ate was just fish and bananas. So she was quite constipated by the time she came back, but she just loved the beauty of the destination. And she said uh, she vowed to return. So we met each other. Being of Indian origin, our family would quite often um, – go to India and celebrate um, over the Christmas, New Year holidays. And so um, we'd one year we went, well, the first year I met her, we ended up um, spending New Year's Eve at Goa. And uh, this was back in 1986, um, where Goa was quite still quite charming. You had the Portuguese element and um, uh, these beautiful beaches and uh, fantastic bars. And I thought Goa was splendid. And um, Ava said, no, no, if you like Goa, um, you have to come and see the Maldives because... Um, it's incomparable. And so um, the next year, we, uh, we, just, we we ended up in the Maldives on holiday, and I was just blown away. Um, I'm, I'm sure you were the first time you came to the Maldives this, um, uh, or, or seen anything like it with these um, literally like sort of hundreds of fly, fried eggs with um, the little island in the middle and then this gin-colored water um, mm. surrounding it. So it was, it was an amazing um, experience. I've never seen anything quite like it. And I think... Um, Ava and I have um, lived a few lives. We've definitely lived a few lives together. And I think we've lived a life in the Maldives because both of us had a a special affinity to the country. So I was studying um, in English universities. I was up at Oxford at the time. English universities, um, the the, the terms are quite short. You have to be up there in college for about eight weeks, uh, three times a year. So more than half of the year, you could be wherever you are, provided you keep up with things. And Mm -hmm. I used to spend a lot of time in the Maldives and uh, we just loved the geography, the destination, but the standards were pretty poor and they weren't terribly sustainable. So um, historically, islands in the Maldives originated from German and Italian tour operators who would um, approach farmers. Sri Lanka was the main tourist destination in South Asia at the time with the equivalent of about 400,000 tourists before the war. And so these Italians and Germans would have these charter flights coming into Sri Lanka with tourists doing tours around the country, a bit of beach. And um, they then thought that, well, perhaps they could add the Maldives as a dive extension. And that became very popular. So they'd go to farmers and say, build us 50 houses, uh, huts, we'll give you a 10-year contract called a bent contract, and we'll guarantee you a certain occupancy at a very low rate. It was all inclusive. And... Mm. um, uh, we'll give you three years in advance. And that's how resorts in the Maldives were built. So um, the, the, the the farmers wanted to keep consumption low because the revenues, there was a ceiling on the revenues. So the bar would be next to the generator, the powerhouse, you know, the worst place possible. Uh, you sat on plastic chairs, neon lights. Everything came in out of tins, you know, even the fruits, um, 
the, that little peach for the dessert <laughs> with the cherry. Mm. It was like <laughs> school. And so um, we just felt we could do something um, a bit a, a bit more exclusive, luxurious and more sustainable because the budgets in those days of these resort developers were so low, they were using coral to build the reefs. Um, everything was salt water, the toilets, the showers, et cetera, which also meant that you couldn't really process the wastewater before you sent it out into the lagoon. So they were either dumping sewage into the lagoon or contaminating the water table with with salt, salty. Mm. So um, we we just felt that we, we 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 were undermining the environment, and we wanted to do something different rather than just go and stay in stay in these hotels. So um, uh, one morning, I went to uh, chartered a boat, um, went to uh, Mali, um, saw um, uh, the, at that time the government's office in Mali was just one large building with two stories. So um, I asked to see the director of foreign investment and, you know, within a couple of minutes I was ushered in because the economy was quite slow. They had nothing to do, the ministers. And yeah. so I, I saw the director and we had tea. He was asking me about life in England and um, how things were. And uh, we sort of had a nice conversation. He was obviously quite bored. And um, he then afterwards said, um, no, unfortunately, you can't do, um, um, you, know, you can't just lease an island as a foreigner and build a house. You have to potentially invest in tourism. And the director of tourism has nine islands that they're auctioning off. So we went up these stairs uh, to a, a room nearby, and there was the director of tourism. And um, again, we had a long chat, and he gave me these big documents. So we bid, but we failed all the time because uh, we wanted to do something luxurious. We didn't want to work with just one tour operator. And if you didn't have a tour operator bed contract, you were already, um, you know, quite a few points were already knocked off. And then uh, you 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 were slightly disqualified by not being Maldivian as well, so um, so we failed and then we gave up on that idea and then in ninety one we were on holiday here again met a Swedish lady who married um, a Maldivian who mm. was a friend of the president and um, it turned out that a friend of his had this island which is where where I'm sitting now uh, Kunfanadu it was called at the time which is now Suneva Fushi and. Um, He'd uh, subleased it to someone who hadn't paid the lease rental for the last two years. He was quite desperate. He had four wives, 24 children. He had about 15 of them, uh, children in Sri Lanka, wow. studying there. And he couldn't afford the, sc the school bills or to pay the rent on his beautiful house because um, he hadn't been paid for two years. So we came in, uh, took over the lease, the sublease, and um, paid him his rental. And we ended up having an island in the Maldives. And then... Um, <laughs> wow, the rest is history, isn't it? After for quite a few mistakes, <laughs> we managed to open the hotel. So we're back in '95. So that was um, a few years ago, ne nearly 30 years. What a wonderful story! I mean, what a beginning, really. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and we knew nothing about its hospitality or construction or um, operating on a remote island. You know, we desalinate our water here, we generate our power, uh, and in a way, I think that was a blessing because um, we weren't conditioned. So our approach to things were always, um, you know, zero based. Wow. Tell me something. Uh, for me personally, I believe, and it is very widely said, that there's something about the ocean that beckons to us. You know, it's where all life began. And just being by the ocean makes us feel like we've come home. Does that tug at your heart too? Do you feel the same way? Absolutely. Um, I, um, I love being by water. Um, not necessarily the ocean, but bodies of water, large bodies of water. So... Um, in, in fact, a feng shui master has also told me um, she's actually studied my 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 my, my chart. Mm. And, um, she actually said the same thing that I I ha I'm, I'm successful when I'm around and surrounded by water. So um, it's it, it's become my life living by by the ocean. You know, Ava and I spend most of our life by a body of water. If it's not um, if it's not here, it's never Fushi where you know, we've got this huge Indian Ocean in, fr in front of us. Um, we spend three weeks in Sweden in the summer. Um, and sorry, actually, it's about five weeks, five, six weeks. We base ourselves out of Ava's um, family's summer house in, in Sweden. And that's um, uh, located on the second deepest lake in Europe. Oh, and, wow. and then we spend about three weeks um, of the year in, in a cottage in Oxford, which where I was studying at, where mm. I was, when I was studying. And um, there we have a nice pond. Uh, we have a waterfall and <laughs> and a pond it's quite small but um so so I, I think there's something about water uh with me and um uh and and certainly i i just love being by the ocean um we have uh, of course you know i travel and i'm away from the sea but it's so nice to come back to the maldives and jump in the water it's um 
make such a difference. How nice. So like you said, uh, Sonu, you've been in this business for so long, for nearly 30 years now. You've seen change in psychology of the luxury traveler over the years. How do you think things have changed, not just in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of what the luxury traveler now demands? So, so the, 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 we've seen change in demographics. So um, when we first opened, our target market was the honeymooner. Mm-hmm. And largely the, the market to these luxury beach boutique resorts was um, uh, the honeymooner. And then people, elderly couples who, um, um, uh, empty nesters they're called, you know, as um, they'd yeah. send kids through school and um, uh, pay, paid off the mortgage and they could, they could now afford um, nice holidays. And so they'd come and stay with us. So that was really our uh, our initial market, um, the majority of our clients. Um, in fact, I think the, the the second year we were open for about six months, we would uh, limit children. So we wouldn't allow children uh, during a certain part of the year. Oh. And that was, that was the nature of the business then. And then you had the result of Thatcherism and Reaganism, uh, you know, in, in, in the sort of the, the 80s. And uh, and then the internet revolution, and then you had the emergence of the BRICS. So suddenly, mm. 2000, 2001, 2002, we, we started to sort of fill up with um, people who were quite young. They were in their 40s, um, and they were having children at an elderly age. And so they're arriving at our resorts with like three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds. And families became very important. So we started building, you know, two-bedroom villas. Uh, of course, we accepted children. Um, started selling residences, um, built a den. And so now, um, funny enough, you know, our, our resorts like Seneva Fushi, Seneva Jani and Seneva Kiri are considered to be um, uh, some of the most welcoming resorts for families and children at the ultra luxury level. I mean, the the den at Seneva Jani, I'm not sure if you saw it when you were there. Mm, it was about to open then. Yes. Okay, it's quite an elaborate facility. And, and here the den at Seneva Fushi um is you know is considered um for many years not just the most elaborate children's facility in the Maldives but one of the most elaborate children's facility of any luxury resort worldwide so so of course that was a demographic change um also you know what we realized ever and I you know when we started at the outset was that um the demands of the leisure traveler were completely different to that of the um corporate traveler and mo- right. most of the Hotel companies, the, the global hotel companies, were focusing really on the businessman. Um, a businessman is very busy. Uh, they're looking at a military style of operation, execution of, of commands, you know, um, ordering room service, checking in. They want everything to be efficient because um, they're there for business. Whereas the leisure travelers, very unbusy. They have a lot of time on their hands and they want to spend time lingering in the bar, chatting with the barman because the wife might be still in the spa, mm-hmm. go to somewhere like the spa. And so when we opened in 95, it was quite funny. Um, uh, the uniform system of accounts, which we still use and which most um, uh, established hotels do, um, has three sections of the pro- of the revenue lines, three main categories of revenue. It's rooms, food and beverage, and then it's a section called minor other department. And these uniform system of accounts uh, are established by the American Hotel and Motel Association. So any four seasons... Any retail, hmm. any any luxury, any any uh, international brand uses this as a PL, and this is the basis for all agreements um, to operate hotels. Um, and um, we, um, minor other departments, was uh, fine if you're a motel where people are staying overnight, or you're a business hotel where people uh, just you know use the rooms, they sleep for the night, they may have breakfast, they may have a business lunch, um, or, or 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 dinner in the evening you know, room service, but they're generally out during the day for meetings, et cetera. Um, right. And so minor other departments is just the phone, the fax, et cetera, quite small. But um, we realized that for our for, for our leisure travelers, this minor other departments, um, we call it life at Seneva. Um, our core purpose is slow life. Hmm. And we actually call it uh, in our PL, we've scrubbed out MOD and it now says life. Um, and it stands for, in short, for learning, inspiring, fun experiences. But it covers everything, so it covers the spa. So that's why with Six Senses, we set up Six Senses bars um, because we realized that that was such an integral part of the experience. Um, we allocate our waiters to, t- to guests rather than to tables. The general mm-hmm. hotelier would allocate the waiter to the table so that you have one waiter looking after five tables in one area so they're always present and can 
um, immediately respond to, to, to requests. It's fine for the businessman who's um, where, where time is of the essence. But, you know, for the leisure traveler, um, they're on holiday. They want to meet the same waiter. They're there for 10 nights. They don't want um, a waiter to continuously ask them uh, whether they'd like uh, milk or, or in, in their tea or whatever. You know, they, they, they just want to deal with the same waiter. And quite often the waiter ends up uh, babysitting the child as well. That's um, the parents. <laughs> have so so it's, it's, it's all of that. The, the whole approach is different. You're trying to um, create a sense of ownership. You're trying to encourage um, hosts to engage and interact with guests. Um, uh, the management style is completely different. So it's all about um, uh, creating this, um, as I said, sense of ownership, empowering the host, uh, giving them the opportunity to, and um, encouraging them to engage as much as possible with our guests. So so I think um, that was in terms of um, a trend that we noticed and we felt that uh, we could differentiate by. And that was, I think, led to our success. And that's why, you know, with successes, we became very successful and grew considerably until I, I sold that business. Um, and um, it was this whole thing of focusing on the experience, which, of course, today, um, everyone talks about, you know, experiences. Uh, but in those days, it was quite rare. Lovely. Uh, coming to these experiences, there's a beautiful concept that you have of barefoot luxury. And I noticed that, you know, simply being dressed informally, simply taking those shoes off, makes everybody more comfortable interacting with strangers at the resort. Is this something that you thought of that, you know, if everyone lets their guard down, people will actually interact? Uh, absolutely. It's so important. Um, so I think when people are barefoot, uh, they feel much more comfortable um, than going for dinner in shorts rather than trousers. True. I think they, if they are in shorts, then they feel much more relaxed and um, other people are in shorts as well. So they, they, they engage with others. And I think that's that's really important. So, for example, here at Sunebu Fushi, where I am, more than 50% of our revenue comes from return guests, guests who are coming back. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. More than 50% of our revenues. It's it's a lot for a long-haul destination because 90 to 95% of our guests are traveling long-haul, more than eight hours to get to us. They've got almost the whole world to choose from, and they're coming back year after year. And one of the big prompters of that is that they um, there are so many opportunities for them to engage and intact, interact with other guests. So we have the, the, the wine cellar mm. where um, they'll, they'll sit around a table uh, with other guests and have a wine tasting. Or they'll go on a dolphin cruise together on the top deck. Or we have so social, like on Tuesday night, where the general manager has a cocktail party, but not in the bar, where the conversation is very stilted and people are still at, at stage one of, um, how do you say, um, uh, human interaction. Um, mm -hmm. Sandbank. So we all go out to a sandbank and, um, you know, everyone's blown away by, firstly, by, by the beauty of, of the location. And, and then secondly, um, uh, they feel as if they're sort of, uh, marooned on this desert island together so they're more likely to go and talk to other guests and so they engage with others um or on the dive boat and then they become great friends um there's um a, a fantastic film producer um very successful film, film producer and um his partner who'd been coming to the maldives with uh for many years um had a had a had a birthday party i think it was her 60th birthday party or 50th or whatever mm -hmm. and in Paris, um, and they had five tables uh, of 10 people on each table. And on their table, um, uh, there were three other couples who they'd met at Suneva Fushi the first time. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it showed the bonds that they'd actually created. That's and, incredible. I mean, truly. Yeah, so people create these bonds. They are relaxed. Um, they're barefoot. And um, they make great friendships. Because, you know, you, you, you have great friends at school and university, and then after university, you, you get a job and you're very busy and you're, you're working long hours and then you have the family and the children and so on. And um, so you, you don't really have the opportunity to make new friends. You tend to stick with old friends. You just simply don't have the bandwidth and time. But when you're on holiday, you have the time to make new friends. And um, so um, if we can create the context, and I think barefoot, being walking barefoot does. Also, it's, 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 it's very healthy for you. We know that. It's grounding. Um, oh, yes. There, there are a lot of studies now on the benefits of earthing and uh, being able to walk barefoot and um, and lots of sort of experts in sort of uh, integrative medicine and um, uh, science scientists looking at forward forward thinking wellness all agree that uh, being able to walk barefoot is um, terribly good for you. Lovely. So I'm very curious about something else, Sonu. As a psychologist and a writer myself, I've always believed that language drives behavior. For mm. instance, at Soneva, you don't have staff, you have hosts. Your bar is called The Gathering. 
you yeah. yourself are the guardian of the culture and not just a ceo so does yeah. this insight come from your background in literature <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting question well i mean i completely agree with you on uh, language driving behavior so mm -hmm. you know think about it as the guardian of the culture um, I'm, I'm trying to do precisely that um, to create a culture uh, that drives behavior. And one of the, the key sort of tools I use is language. So we actually have a dictionary. So when you join as a new host, uh, there are 500 words um, in the Suneva dictionary, um, which you're given. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. So example, we don't have a head office. Head office sounds as if um, they're commanding and controlling everything. It's the hub. It's, it's a support unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the core, you know, so I'm a member of the core. Um, I'm not the C-suite or whatever. Um, we have um, the operators called first impressions. We try and sort of give job titles that uh, best describe the key role. So as, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, if you look at my car, business card, it says guardian of the culture, and then in brackets it'll say CEO and joint creative director. But um, I'm the guardian of the culture because that is the main objective of a le of leader of an organization, at least in my views, in my view. Um, our Remon, who looks after operations and um, and uh, and development, is is the guardian of the experience. Every general, every property has a general manager, whose whose real title is the guardian of the experience as well. So, so language, I think, does drive behaviour. Um, my 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 background in English literature did that help? Uh, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, most I think it. I think it reflects so beautifully. It's just such an inspired way of running something. You can see that you're having fun through it. That you're bringing your inspiration into it is just so fresh. Yeah, no. So we have um, we 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 get together twice a year. Um, you know, um, uh, with with our senior hundred leaders. So as a core, we're together uh, four times a year, um, and then twice a year we have um, a greater group of people, uh, mm -hmm. which is you know our hundred seat, and it's our um, it's our semi annual um, sort of meetings. Um, which most organizations have. We call them the energizer. So we're together. Uh -oh. um, everyone's, uh, there are about 100 people in the room. We're sitting on beanbags. Um, we're in small groups of eight. And I will, um, I'll, I'll sort of put, put, put things together. So the morning is about four hours, both mornings, four hours of learning from me, where I'll put together some thoughts, some um, uh, things. Uh, so the first day is more like learning, and the second day is, um, um, you know, innovation where we're trying to be creative. And, um, you know, when we're all sitting there on these beanbags and then the second afternoon at the very end of these two days of the Energizer, um, we have a thing called shared experiences, um, mm -hmm. which is half an hour where in our groups of eight, we'll share sort of experiences that have been, uh, that, have, that have touched us over the the last, um, sorry, just two things, the, the last, um, six months or or it could be something from our past if it's a new host um so we sort of go through in a way our recent lifelines and um, everyone's got a glass of champagne and um those can be happy moments or or sad moments and then um after that we do the Suneva language um where for about 30 minutes we brainstorm on new words that we could add to oh, wow. that would would make us more more um uh how to see make, make us um more more clear as an organization I think this also has given birth to your concept of barefoot booksellers because it's yeah. not very often that you see books being given so much preference and limelight on a resort. But I think this also stems from your love of books. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, um, our partner in, with the Barefoot Bookshop is Philip Blackwell. So um, I'm not uh -huh. sure if you um, if you know Oxford at all, but right in the middle of Oxford, in the in the in the middle of the old town, hmm. uh, you have a bookshop called Blackwell's. Um, Yes, I was there last summer, in fact. Oh, you were? Okay, yeah. right. So so Philip, I think, is like it's third, fourth generation of mm -hmm. Blackwells. And so he sold a lot of the business to one of the other big uh, booksellers, but he kept that shop in Oxford. And um, funny enough, he now he now um, has set up a company called The Ultimate Library, mm -hmm. where he um, puts libraries together, as a, together at hotels. So he helped. Um, I met him many years ago. He helped us at Six Senses with our libraries, and we initially do it on barter against a holiday, where he'd sort of fill our library with great books, and he had great, great, great taste in, in books. And um, yeah, and that, so now he does it more formally. So he set up a company, and um, he provides the libraries of um, a lot of the top brands, Amman, Ritz Carlton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so um, I was having lunch with him in Oxford a couple of years ago, and um, uh, I, I said I'd like to set up a bookshop because the libraries 
become outdated quite soon. And uh, it's nice to have um, an area where guests can buy the latest books. So um, he said he was on for it. So he's he actually provides all the books and um, and, and chooses the Barefoot Bookseller to come and operate the, the shop for us. How nice. It's hands down my favorite part of the resort. So, <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, uh, so you know this generation is so quick. Everybody needs instant gratification. And yet you have managed to appeal to this generation in such a nice way. You've made the slow life look so luxurious. It's the exact opposite of what the world currently is running towards. So how did this whole juxtaposition happen? Yeah, I, I, I think um, it's, it's, it's this whole thing of um, uh, contrast, isn't it? I mean, you want, mm. uh, when you're on holiday, you want, you want, uh, you, you cherish the exact opposite. So if you think about luxury, it's a word that's very often misused. And people sometimes even refer to objects as luxury. So they'll refer to gold and gilt and beautiful chandeliers and marble as luxury. But luxury is not an object. It's essentially, it's a philosophy. It's that which is rare to you. That's um, you, not commonplace. It's, um, you, know, you don't get it every day. But at the same time, true, it rings a chord in your heart when you touch it. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you think about um, our, um, our guests and the context of our guests, they're, le they're living in urban environments. So um, they, they're used to um, the gold, the guilt and all of that. And, um, you know, for, for them, just the simplicity of being in our resorts is, 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 is rare. And, um, and, and, and so we always think about that. How can we create um, unique, rare experiences for our guests, things that they don't get every day? And, um, and so that's, that's really um, what drives us. Well, that's beautiful, really. Also, uh, from a psychologist's perspective comes the next question. The world is reeling from this mental health crisis at the moment. Slowing down, living mindfully, it does offer a certain reprieve and it allows healing. Uh, do you include any mental health services at all your resorts or have you any plans to incorporate them in the future? Um, well, I, I think, you know, by, by being a, a, a contrast to the daily, da daily reality, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, this, this whole idea of uh, giving people complete contrast to their daily lives. So uh, we move the clocks forward. You know, if you think about it, most people, including me, I, um, <laughs> you know, have, have calls slotted one after the other. And we're continuously looking at our watch um, right. alarm on so that we, we don't miss the next call. We're not late for the you know, next meeting or whatever. So, um, you know, we, 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 when guests arrive, the first thing we do is we, we, we tell them that we've moved the clocks one hour forward. <laughs> so the day, <laughs> so it sort of just makes uh, time meaning meaningless, um, and um, it's so I think just being in that environment where you're without shoes, you know, before you know, before you even set foot on our jetties, you've taken your shoes and put them in a bag. Um, the Barefoot Guardian has told you that we've changed the time on you um, because we 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 feel it's better for it to be one hour later, so you can watch the sunset. Um, I think that already soothes and heals people. Um, we know that barefoot uh, walking is grounding. It's, I'm, I'm sure it's a uh, good sort of um, psych psych psychology. It's good for you. Um, mm -hmm. We have, um, uh, you know, at, at, at the Suneva Soul, we have um, our yoga masters that offer meditation uh, yes. yoga as well with breathing. That, that clearly helps. Uh, there's a lot of exercise. We know how important exercise is for um, mental well-being. So, you know, we do have fitness masters. Um, there are the various treatments we offer. Um, in in the Seneva Soul, and then we do from time to time have visiting um, experts. Like, um, for example, we have Alan Dolan here, who's a breathwork expert. So um, you know, we know that breathwork can uh, bring out repressed emotions. Um, we have Malmilda Gill um, from London, who's um, a fantastic hypnotherapist. She was here um, about a week or two back. So we do um, we do have people also at the Seneva Soul who are supporting. Our, our guests and our hosts with their mental well-being. Lovely. Let me ask you something very personal now, Sonu. Oh. We've all heard of a physical first aid box, right? Something that we keep our band-aids and our yeah. antiseptic lotions in for those minor cuts and bruises. But what if you were to have a mental first aid box for those days when you're emotionally run down and you want to take care of yourself, something which would make you happy the minute you opened it. So what would you personally put in your own mental first aid box? Right. Um, does it have to be an actual object? Um, 
Uh, I've had some guests come with beautiful metaphysical boxes. So take your. Oh, oh right. Yeah. So, so I, I think in my first aid box, um, I think doing some activity in the morning is always very important in, in terms of putting oneself in the right frame of mind, either yoga or uh, fitness, and then doing meditation. I, I just find that, um, you know, these eight pillars of joy um, that um, the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu articulated, mm -hmm. Harold Abrahams, and, you know, which he captured in the Book of Joy, which I'm sure you've read, um, mm -hmm you know, about gratitude, perspective, forgiveness, compassion, etc. I think um, all of those pillars are great. And so meditating on those, I, I, I think, will help me um, a lot considerably. I, I think um, the other thing is chocolate, dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it, it never lets you down. It always puts me in a good mood. So it's, um, yeah, I, I suppose that's, that, that's what I'd have in my mental box, mental first aid. Well, that sounds like a solid box to have because you've got all your pillars in place and you're doing it more mindfully than mindlessly. You're doing it on a daily basis. So I think it just makes it more uh, credible and, you know, makes it more possible that you won't need a mental first aid box if you're doing something on a daily basis. Well, uh, before I wrap up the conversation and before I let you go, I have the floor open to you now. Is there any question that you would like to ask me as a psychologist? Um. I'm just thinking, so, so tell me about your experience with us at Suneva Jani. Um, how, how, you know, you, 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 you seem to have been um, touched by it. I mean, the fact that um, you, you're interviewing me and you, you sort of were in touch means that you enjoyed it. Um, what, what was it that really hit you from a, 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 a sort of deep emotional level? I think it was the feeling that a, it was a very important occasion for all of us. We were celebrating my husband's 40th. And uh, the way we arrived and the way we felt everything, it was so intense. I think the tactile experience, the food, the presence of everybody who just didn't know how to say no, that was the first thing. And the second thing is when the lights went down at night. On the first night, we all thought we were going to fall right into the ocean because we won't be able to find our way back. And then we realized that when the light gets dimmer, we actually get more tuned into the night and we feel at peace. So the second night, we were more in tune with the environment. The third night, we felt we had morphed into the waves. I mean, we were part of the whole atmosphere. When right. we came back, we were jarred by what we came back to, you know, the light, the sound, the action all around us. And we said three days and we were transformed. And right. after that, we literally changed as travelers. We, we all as a group travel very frequently. Yeah. But somewhere we carried that with us, you know, that it's not difficult to be mindful it's not difficult to kind of engage in sustainable practices, which is very rare that one resort can change your mindset as a traveler for such a long time, which is why I think it stayed with all of us, not just me, the entire group who was there at Surema Jani that time. We all started, you know, kind of incorporating these tiny changes, being nicer to the environment, being nicer to ourselves, traveling lighter. I think we had the smallest suitcases coming there because we had no shoes. And something so simple made such a difference to the way we experienced even packing and unpacking. So I think those little pieces of the jigsaw just fell together and created this amazing picture that we didn't expect. Yes, I think the holiday starts when you start um, packing. Absolutely. A resort because you don't have to bring so many dresses and shoes and so on. And you can really pack for yourself. So the books, the um, the the snorkel, the mask or, um, or the tennis shoes, you know, so uh, you're really packing for you to enjoy the holiday rather than packing for others. Correct. Uh, which is still so often the, the, the case, isn't it? There are so many hotels where when you pack to go on holiday, you're actually packing to impress others. Um, long dresses, high heels, oh, yes. bags, etc., to impress others. And, and you're not really fully relaxed. And um, so um, it's, it was really nice to hear that, uh, Kinjal. Thank you for that. Because um, in, in fact, I think um, uh, the second thing, if, if we were talking about physical objects that would go in my mental first aid boxes, um, all these wonderful letters we've received from our guests, um, uh, similar to, to what you just described. And um, I think for Ava and I, that, that gives us a lot of um, energy to continue uh, when you hear these compliments and how um, people were deeply touched. Um, and, and it had, um, you know, we really impacted their lives. Um, and, um, and and that's great. And I, and I think, you know, now that we've opened Suneva Soul, um, that's been um, e even more rewarding. Um, there was a guest who... Um, and we, we, we were offering stem cells here now. So there was a guest who had a stem cell treatment about three days ago. Hmm. And I heard back from the Suneva Soul team that she used to take um, injections every um, every couple of hours to stop, sorry about that, 
Um, she used to take injections every couple of hours to stop the pain um, because she has a cortisol deficiency. Mm. And um, she's now not needed to take the injections and is no pain at all. Oh, so, how gratifying is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is um, really impactful. So um, it's, uh, yeah, no, it's wonderful. And, and, and then, of course, I mean, that's obviously a, a, quite a serious level uh, where we have impacted someone's lives. I mean, we've, there was someone else who had breast cancer who um, was here uh, she did various treatments at the Seneva Soul. Um, she was going to go back to do something like um, an operation or radiation or chemotherapy. I can't remember exactly what the oncologist had prescribed, uh, but she was definitely going to do something quite invasive. And um, when she went back, um, the oncologist told her that her, her, her tumor had shrunk. So wow. she's now continuing on um, what she started here, um, and we, we, which is great. And hopefully that will be a much longer lasting recovery because we know with breast cancer that... Um, radiation causes secondary cancers you know in 16 percent of cases so um so it was, it was really nice that we managed to avoid that so those, those are a few wellness examples but um you know, you know reading the trip advisor feedback it's um it's wonderful when you um get, get lovely lovely compliments so thank you but this uh, is so beautiful so no thank you so much you know for taking the time and for leading us all into this mini holiday right now so okay. if we all had a little trip with you we could hear the birds in your background we heard about this wonderful journey that you've had it wasn't easy for everybody you know you've for anybody who's successful, this seemed like an overnight success. But all those years of failing behind that and all the things that you've learned along the way have made Soneva what it is. So it's been amazing talking to you about it. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. My pleasure. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Kenjal. Take care. Bye-bye.